Jack West, MD. I'm an associate clinical professor in medical oncology at City of Hope Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area, uh, and also founder and president of Grace. Uh, Isabel, can you tell us who you are and what you are? Sure. Um, my name is Isabel Preschigal. I am a thoracic oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and I am very excited to be here today speaking to all of you. And Joan. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Joan Schiller. I'm a medical oncologist um, living now in Northern Virginia. I was formerly the deputy director of the Cancer Center at UT Southwestern and also of the Shar Cancer Center in um, in Northern Virginia as part of ANOVA. Excellent. I'm glad to be with you. Let's start with a discussion of what I think is potentially one of the biggest practice changing uh, studies, which is called Empower 010. And uh, for those following, this is in the setting of patients with early stage uh, resectable lung cancer. It was focused on patients with stage 1B to 3A non small cell lung cancer and uh, was for patients who underwent surgery already as their first treatment and then had one to four cycles of post-operative or adjuvant chemotherapy, which is a standard of care. There were 1,280 patients enrolled in that part and got through the chemotherapy, and then patients were randomized uh, to either undergo best supportive care, which is in the red on the in the middle of the screen, which is essentially following patients clinically and by imaging, or to undergo a year of atezolizumab or tecentric immunotherapy. This is uh, an intravenous medication to stimulate the immune system, and it was given uh, for every three weeks for 16 cycles or right about a year. And then patients were followed to see how they did. Uh, the study had a complex design in terms of how the results were analyzed, but the primary endpoint, the main thing that the study focused on was the proportion of patients who did not have evidence of their cancer coming back over the time they were followed. But the on the right side of the, the slide here, you can see this hierarchical statistical structure, pretty complex, essentially starting by looking at patients with higher stage, higher risk disease, stage two or three, and looking at their disease-free survival, how well they did without the cancer coming back, um, and looking at patients with uh, with a PDL1 positive cancer, which is about two thirds of the cancers out there. About a third to 40% don't have any of this marker called PDL1 that is associated with a stronger probability of a cancer responding to immune therapies, at least in patients with more advanced disease. If that part of the study was positive, uh, they would look at the disease-free survival in all of the patients with stage 2 or 3A disease, so the higher risk proportion of patients, um, and that would then include patients even with no PDL1 expression on their tumors. And if that was also positive, they would look in an even broader population that included patients uh, with stage 1B disease, so a lower risk still. And then only if all of those conditions were positive would they formally look at the overall survival. And that's a somewhat complex and uh, frustrating, I would even say, or at least controversial question, because to many of us, the key thing that we really care about is whether more people are alive at uh, years into treatment in this setting of treating people for cure. But that's what we have. Um, and what we saw, and this goes back to the initial highly visible and, and anticipated study uh, presented at uh, ASCO, uh, was a significant difference favoring the patients who got the year of immune therapy, uh, about a two-thirds uh, better 
chances. So uh, this hazard ratio of 0.66 means that about a 34% improvement in the chance of being alive at a given time point uh, without the cancer coming back in patients with pdl one positive cancer and higher uh, risk disease. And uh, it was a little diluted if you included the patients without pdl one positive cancer. And what's, what's really, uh, I, I think, been the most interesting question is new data that was presented um, at, uh, uh, this should be actually the ESMO meeting. What's, uh, what's most interesting and most current is a breakdown where they look at the patient's outcomes depending on the degree of pdl one expression. And this is a specific plot where the more these diamond shapes are off to the left, the more the benefit is for the immune therapy. And this essentially shows that there was a clear striking benefit for disease-free survival in the patients who had high PDL1, about 28 to 30 percent of patients. High PDL1 is a measure of 50 percent or higher, and there was really no evidence of a benefit in the patients with negative PDL1. And when you look at the patients with low PDL1, that 1 to 49 percent range, they are very likely to be included in an FDA approval but the benefit doesn't seem to be nearly as striking in these patients. And so I think we are going to end up soon with an FDA approval for giving this agent, a tezolizumab or tecentric immune therapy for up to a year in patients who have undergone surgery. Ideally, they will have had chemotherapy. And the approval I think is going to be for patients with any PDL1 expression on their cancer. But my read of these data are that the benefit really seems to be uh, limited or at least far more convincing in the patients with high PDL1 than patients with low PDL1. And so, uh, Joan, if I can start with you, I mean, we have been uh, working in this uh, in lung cancer during an era when chemotherapy showed a benefit for disease-free survival that wasn't impressive to us until it showed an improvement in overall survival. We don't have that yet here, but uh, do is it enough of a benefit in disease-free survival until we see overall survival for you to say this is good enough to treat patients with this? And would you treat a narrow population or a broader population here? So that's a real good question, Jack. Um, and to some people, it might not seem obvious why there could be a difference in disease-free survival and not in overall survival. Intuitively, you would think that if the cancer doesn't come back, the people would live longer. That's not always the case, however. Um, sometimes, and I think one ra possible rationale for that is if the um, the patient gets treated when the cancer does come back, that may improve their survival right there. So it might be a matter of treating early to prevent it from coming back, but then it comes back, or waiting until it does. And if you wait until it does, you potentially spare a lot of people who, where it's not going to come back anyway. Right. Right. Um, so I personally would wait, I think, particularly for the overall survival curves. Um, do you have those, Jack, here? Well, right now, what we have is only very immature data. Okay. I, uh, this, is, uh, this is overall survival from, uh, from the ASCO meeting, and it's, I think, in the right direction, but it's too early to say. And I think that the, the key question that you bring up is, we know some patients are already cured, they can't get more cured. You're talking about a year of therapy that is generally well tolerated, but immune therapy can sometimes have lasting and occasionally serious side effects. I mean, people may have long-term thyroid dysfunction or diabetes or rarely serious issues and it's one thing if we know that more people are going to be alive. And it's 
Uh, but it's another if you're talking about adding a full year of treatment to people and they end, could end up doing just as well uh, if they just get treated only if the cancer comes back. Not to mention the cost. Not to mention the cost, yeah. Yes, and for um, I, I think that as physicians, we sometimes forget to discuss that. But I recently had a family member who came down with cancer. And so all of a sudden, I my family was faced with this. And you'd be surprised with the deductibles and the co-pays. It added up really quick. And this is not going to be a cheap treatment by any means. No, I'm, it's about, I'm sure it's 200000 250000 for the year. So, yeah. Right. And many people may not require it. As you said, they may already be cured and they can't get more cured. So... So, Isabel, what's your perspective here? Because I've historically been more of a purist about I need to see overall survival. I think that I'm a little softer. I'm more inclined to say, while we don't know the results, I think that, that immunotherapy has had such sustained benefits when we've seen them that I'm inclined to give the benefit of the doubt for patients with high PDL one I'm far less convinced and frankly disinclined to recommend it for those in the 1 to 49% or lower um, but but I think it's a matter of judgment and there's there are people who are more on the spectrum of I need to see overall survival before I change practice there's people who are inclined to recommend it pretty broadly where are you and your colleagues at memorial um, I think that you and Joan bring very important points to this. Um, in addition to the cost, I think picking the right patient for this is the most important thing. Um, I definitely agree. I think I would definitely put a pause on someone who had no PDL1 expression or PDL1 expression from 1% to 49%. Those with 50% and over, where we are seeing the DFS benefit, that seems to be more notable to me. Um, I think it would be a risk versus benefit discussion. It would not be a decision that I made lightly, but it's not something that I would withhold from my patient. I would educate them and make sure they were aware of this option and aware of this impending possible approval um, and new exciting data. Uh, something that I think might be helpful for my decision making, and I know is in the pipeline, is all the work that's being done about um, ctDNA. And perhaps, you know, someone that is, uh, you know, a persistent secretor, we could say, might be someone that I would offer this to because I would at least have some data to say, hey, listen, even though your tumor has been resected, you still have this circulating tumor DNA that lets me know that there is a high potential that a tumor cell might want to go and make a home somewhere else later on. So if we could do something to re reduce the risk of that happening, does that sound like something you'd be interested in? And then I would go through the data. And I think I could use that as a little more background to support this discussion. And I will say that uh, there were some data from some recent meetings about ctDNA. I think that would be terrific if we could enrich better. Uh, that makes great sense. The challenge is we aren't quite there in 2021. I think we will be getting there. But, you know, the question is, what are we going to do, you know, for the patient who comes into our clinic in the next month? Mm -hmm.